Turn with me, if you would, to um, the book of Deuteronomy. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Deuteronomy. You got that right. 60 years. I, I You know, I'm kind of embarrassed that, that the pastor would say that because I... I uh, <clears throat> I don't like to believe it, for one thing. I started when I was five years old. I hope you all know that. Um, I believe in laughter. That's part of endurance. There's an old saying, he that laughs last, laughs loudest. The truth is, he that laughs last. And so, if you want to laugh, if you want to last, keep laughing. And don't put the key to somebody. Don't put the key to your joy in somebody else's pocket. Okay, we're going to talk about, and this is by the pastor's request. So if it doesn't work, blame him. All right. <laughs> Foundations for the future. We're going to do covenant this morning, and we're going to do kingdom tonight, and we're going to do church Wednesday night. Hope all of you come back. These are three vital topics. I'm reading from the New King James, Deuteronomy 7, verse uh, 6, and I'll read, I think, through 11. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant. Say that with me. Who keeps his covenant. Let's say it with gusto. Who keeps. How many of you are glad God's faithful? Amen. Amen. Who keeps his covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. I'll just stop right there and then go over to. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, 1 Corinthians 3. Now, we're talking about foundations. Aren't you glad this building's on a good foundation? Do you have storms up here? you ever have storms? We have them down my way. And um, you find out what your foundations are when storm. Anybody here going through a storm? Uh, anybody here have been through a storm? You ever been through a storm? How about spiritual storms? You ever been through one of those? How many of you know there are such things? Well, you need to be on a good foundation. I want to read from 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verse 10. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one, each one, say each one with me, each one, I mean, you know that includes you, each one, each one's works will become clear. For the day will declare. In other words, there comes a day when a storm's coming, and it will reveal how you built. Because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test. <laughs> I know we love that word, don't we? I just did a stress test. I don't need any more stress, but stress is a test. And I passed, thank God. But I failed before. Had open heart surgery, quadruple bypass. So I really rejoice when I pass a stress test. We're going to all have a stress test. Some of us are having one right now. 
and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is, how you built. If anyone's work which has been built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet so as through fire. I'll stop there. What I want to do, <clears throat> and you pray for me because, A, God needs to help me. Secondly, it's very important that you understand this. I'm going right to the heart of our nation's problems, the church's problems, our personal problems. I couldn't possibly dig deeper than I'm going to try to dig this morning, and this needs about a month of messages, but I'm going to try to cover in a few minutes. But you won't hear anything any more important in your life than what you're going to hear this morning. Not because I'm going to say it well, but because it is an eternal subject at the heart of the nature of God. I think that most of us would say, I love God, and God loves me. I'm even old that he loves us with a different kind of love than we love him. And we have to learn how to receive his love into our lives and love the way he does. And that is a major challenge because I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure that I love like God does. And I am sure that the word love is the, probably the most corrupted love in our language. And there are two different words in the original language for our kind of love and his kind of love. So we want to get established on God's love and the nature of God's love. And we want those that come after us to be able to build on, on a good foundation. My primary purpose at this stage of my life is to be sure my kids and grandkids are secure. I'm very thankful for my parents and grandparents and what they put in my life. I thank God for good foundations. I, I'm deeply grieved at the garbage a lot of people are trying to build their lives on. Not because it's their intentions, because they never knew better. They were never given a good foundation. But there is a foundation, and we want to try to find that foundation and be established not on culture, but on God's nature and who God is. I, I really want to encourage us to understand that God is not the same as our culture. I guess everybody knows that. Jesus uh, said to his disciples in John 15, 16, you did not choose me. How many of you know it wasn't your choice of God first? But I chose you and called you and ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit, I maybe know what word comes next, and that your fruit should remain. Let me, let me, let me give you a short version. I have called you to produce enduring fruit. The scripture I read says, if any man's fruit endures, he will get a reward. If not, he will be saved, but he'll have to go through the fire. He'll see his fruit burned up. So, you know, we want our families to endure. We want what we give our lives to, to endure. I, I think the saddest thing in the world has to be to come to the end of your life and know that there's nothing left to show for why you lived. So <clears throat> what endures? What's a good foundation for the future? And um, I think a lot of people are thinking about that right now. When you build a business, will it last? When you have a family, will it last? If you start a church, will it last? Will what you're doing make a difference for a long period of time? 
Our foundation is not really visible. What we really stand on is invisible. <clears throat> I love the old hymn. It may be my favorite. If not, it's one of the closest. Solid rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is what? Sinking sand. I love the verse that says, When all around my soul gives way, he then, he still, is all my hope and stay. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. I mean, you know, life has whelming floods. When all around my soul gives way. What do you do when you're by yourself? <clears throat> what do you do when nobody stands with you? What do you do when it seems like life is against you? Where do you stand? Well, that's what this is about. That's when we know how we built his oath not ours his oath his covenant his covenant his blood now I want to Lord help your servant I want to I want to give you I'll tell you my outline I never do this I'll tell you my outline my outline is Founded on the faithfulness of God. That's point number one. If you're a note taker, you can write it down. If you, if I get too fast, raise your hand. Founded on the faithfulness of God. Say it with me. Founded on the faithfulness. What we are standing on is God is faithful. He cannot lie. The promises of God are yea and amen. Not yes or no, but yes and yes. Founded on God's faithfulness. I, uh, <clears throat> I love the old hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. It doesn't say, Great is my faithfulness. It says, Great is thy faithfulness. The Bible says that when we are unfaithful, Psalm 89, he remains faithful still. You know, it, circumstances are not faithful. They're always changing. You can't rely on what appears it, because it disappears. But you can rely on God because he changes not. There is no shadow of turning in him. You have to decide, who do you trust? What do you trust? Where is your trust? Where is it? When you say, Lord Jesus, I trust you with all my heart. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You, you say, well, I, I trust Jesus. And then things start getting messed up. And you say, what is going on? I don't know what I'm going to do. Now, circumstances have to be shaken for you to find where you stand. I believe the Bible says everything that can be will be shaken till that which cannot be shaken will remain. If your trust is in the wrong place, God's guaranteed to reveal it to you. Isn't that a good thing? It's a good thing. I didn't say it wasn't painful. I just said it's a good thing. If your trust is in somebody, trust is in situations, finances, whatever, it is, your health, God sometimes will shake that. Now, our, our foundation is the faithfulness of God. I, uh, 1965, began to study covenant. Uh, I won't go through all the details, but my denomination wasn't happy with me. I won't tell you all the reasons why. It, it was, well, I'll tell you why. <laughs> it wasn't uh, because of sin. It wasn't really heresy. It was because I was tired of looking at the church the way it appeared to be and then trying to preach about the church the way it was. And I decided that the church needed to change. And so I began to preach out of Acts, and I began to preach a little too loud and too hard, and they caused a lot of problems. 
and um, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, and people thought I'd turned holy roller, and actually there wasn't anything unusual about our services, except it was uh, the truth, and uh, so I got investigated, and they encouraged me. They didn't kick me out, but they encouraged me to go elsewhere, and uh, after seven years of that, I did. Now, in 1965, at the beginning of that period, God led me to Genesis 15. And uh, let, me, let me say that I'm, I'm pretty familiar with church life. I used to live in a church when I was a kid. I always lived in a pastorium, which is like an aquarium, but you keep pastors in it. It was next to the church. So I, I, I've got church memorized. My father was a minister and so forth. Now, God led me to Genesis 15, where he made a covenant with Abraham. You remember he told Abraham to make sacrifices, to kill animals and cut them in half, and there was a trail of blood, and uh, at the end was a turtle dove and a pigeon, which were not cut in half. And um, Abraham was, <clears throat> he made the sacrifice, and, and uh, he went and sat under a tree, and darkness came on him, and God walked between the pieces flaming fire. Now, I read this, and I knew God was leading me there, but I made a big mistake. I preached that God and Abraham made a covenant. Let me just say this. Whatever covenant you've made with God is not going to hold you because you're a sinner by nature, and you're going to be unfaithful at times. Now, if you have not ever been, come and teach me. Now, um, <laughs> but... Psalm 89 says, when we are unfaithful, he remains faithful still. Aren't you glad for his faithfulness? Now, what happened, and I learned this eventually, God made a covenant with Abraham. That is, a covenant is God's sovereign declaration of his love and mercy to someone of his choice. It's God's sovereign. God, how many of you know God is sovereign? How many of you understand why God does what he does? Do you? I know. He's God. Pastor said he's God and we're not. That's a revelation right there for a lot of people. So God chooses. God chose Israel, he said. You didn't choose me. I chose you. He told his disciples, you, you didn't choose me. I chose you. God chooses. I don't know why God chooses. God chooses. And uh, when he does... He makes a covenant. He gives his word to someone of his choice. And when he does, he binds himself to his word, and that binds him to that person and or that nation, and that's called a covenant where God binds himself. Now, that's a vertical covenant. There are other kinds of covenants, but that's not what I'm talking about. God gives his word, he binds himself to that person to save them, to redeem them. It doesn't mean they'll ever have trouble. It just means when they get in trouble, God will go with them. Now, covenants, biblical covenants, are made in blood. How I many of you know we're talking serious now? They're made in blood. Why? Because a covenant is a pledge of life. When two people make a covenant, that's a different kind of, when the two people make a covenant, historically, there was a shedding of blood. Why? Because they were pledging life for life. It was like a person saying, if I break this covenant, I want to die. I will give my life to keep this covenant. Anybody here married? Anybody here married? Remember what you said? Anybody remember what you said? <laughs> Anybody remember anything about it at all? <laughs> Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? Do you, <laughs> Do you promise to love her in sickness and in health, for better, for worse? <laughs> and now all these conditions... And everybody's smiling. They don't understand that. They just say it. You could say, I'm going to fly to Africa. It wouldn't make any difference because they don't know what they're saying. 
anyway, <laughs> and pay all my bills. You know, they, they don't know what they're saying. They're anesthetized. And then he says, till death do you part. You say, till death do me part. Now, you just said death. You, you got that, didn't you? You just said death. That's covenant. You know what they ought to do is shed a little blood in a marriage ceremony. <laughs> Give me your finger. <laughs> This is what it will be like. <laughs> I think we need to have a benediction right now, you know. All right. That's covenant. Two become one. For this cause, the Lord said to Adam, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they two shall become. I mean, even know it's a becoming process. They two shall become one, but you have pledged to become one. You have given an oath. To become one. Uh, then Jesus repeated it. Matthew 19, 5 and 6. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. A man leaves his father. I, we could talk about that, but the man has to become, I don't want to say independent, but he has to be able to take care of a wife. <clears throat> For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. I thought my parents would be grieved when I left. <laughs> they said, bye-bye. <laughs> this is not your home anymore. They told me that. This is not your home anymore. Your home is where your wife is. That was sobering. My bed wasn't my bed anymore. My dresser wasn't my dresser anymore. My bathroom wasn't my bathroom anymore. I had to get some... I had to get out. Anyway, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, <clears throat> and they too shall become, that's what covenant is, one flesh, oneness. The foundation that you face a storm on is the knowledge that God has made an oath. The Bible says he swore by himself. that he would redeem you if you received it. Your life is based, I, I, you know, uh, folks, if I, if I start telling stories, I'm not going to finish. I'm not going to finish it anyway. Um, <clears throat> but if, if you live to be 70 years old or whatever, and probably a lot quicker, you're going to go through some storms. You're going to find out where your faith is. I had a wife and a, a small boy, uh, less than three years old, and uh, I faced the possibility of not having a job. And I had to decide, was I going to say what I saw the truth to be, or was I going to sell out for security, which really isn't a security at all? Thank God I made a good choice. God took care of me. I think we're always better off for doing the will of God. Now, uh, covenant history. Jeremiah 33. I, I'm, I'm going to read from Jeremiah 33 if I can find it. And um, just listen to this. This is written 600 years before Christ. Um. <clears throat> Fine, I, I'm going to find what I'm talking about. All right. Verse 19, Jeremiah 33. The word of the Lord came to me saying, to Jeremiah saying, Thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with day and night, with day and my covenant with night, so that there will not be day and night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David my servant so that he shall not have a son to reign in, on his throne and the Levites and ministers and priests. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, nor the sand of the, the sea measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David, my servant, the Levites, who minister to me. Now, 
How many of you know Jesus is the son of David? He reigns in heaven right now. He will reign again on the earth. Now, God said, I made a covenant with day. That's what God does. When God starts to administer, now, tonight I want to talk about the kingdom of God, which is the government of God. Before God governs, he covenants. Let me, let me just say it this way. A man can't lead a family till he makes the covenant to have a family. And then when he leads the family, that's government. And the mother leads too. They, there's a government over the children. But first, you have to have a commitment to be together, to be one. And uh, God promises his word. We call it the old covenant and the new covenant. Um, I'm looking for another verse here. God says, that he's going to make a new covenant. And uh, it's going to be written. Here it is. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. Now, this is, this is 600 years before Christ. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, covenant they broke verse 33 33 but this is the covenant i will make with the house of israel after those days says the lord i will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and i will be their god and they shall be my people now this is a prophecy and then jesus comes and we're going to have communion in a few minutes and Jesus comes and he says to them in the book of Luke, you've heard this before. Um, it's important. 600 years later, he says, this is my body which is given for you in remembrance of me, the cup, this cup is the new covenant, new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Jesus is the sacrifice. He said, I'm making a new covenant. I'm giving an oath to you. As God, I change not. Your hope is built on nothing less than my blood covenant and righteousness don't trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on jesus name he fulfilled the covenant now in hebrews 9 is another great chapter on the blood of christ remember this when you plead the blood when you say nothing but the blood when you say i'm saved by the blood it's not just the blood, it's the blood of the covenant. It's that God has shed blood, his own blood, the blood of Christ, holy blood, sinless blood, to make a covenant with you that he will be faithful to even sometimes when you're not. Is that a good thing? Can you rely on him? When you say, I trust him, do you understand you trust the covenant that he made with us? Now, I want to take this a step further right quick, and thank you for indulging me. If you get through before I do, I understand. Um, covenant is the foundation for family. Now, this is really important because... How many of you are glad you're born into God's family in security? God's family is secure. Now, churches are not always secure. But we're not born again into a church. We're born again into the family of God. So, 
When you're born into God's family, you're born into something you can trust. Now, a lot of people, they get discouraged. They get mad at the failures of the church. Listen, if your confidence is in the church, as wonderful as it may be, you're making a mistake. You hear me? Where's your confidence? I said, where's your confidence? It's in the Lord. The problem with churches is it's got people in it. If it wasn't for the people, church would be a wonderful thing. And thank God for the people. Thank God for the church. We'll talk about church Wednesday night. But the trust is not in the church. It's in what? It's in the blood of Christ. It's in the covenant that he made. Now, if you understand your security is in God and not in yourself and not in other people, now let's say you're going to have a family. How many of you want that to be secure? So God says, okay, I want you to make a covenant with that woman. I think, um, I think the woman ought to have something to say too. But I'm going to tell you, I'm kind of old-fashioned. I believe men are responsible for their families. Are you listening to me? I didn't hear an amen, but I hope you are. I believe men are I believe the number one problem in all the world is the lack of fathers who are faithful to God, faithful to their wives and faithful to the kids. So when I emphasize men, I don't want to hear a woman say, well, you don't, you don't appreciate women. Listen, the best thing you can do for women and children is raise up godly men. When I was pastoring, I spent a lot of time counseling women. 90% of the people that want to be counseled is women. And you know what I discovered? 90% of their problems was men. <laughs> so I said, why mess around with the, with the symptoms? Let's go straight to the problem. So I started trying to reach men. Now, God tells a man, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. I realize I'm swimming up, upstream here. I may plow up the snake, but I'm telling you the truth. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and what? Cleave to his wife. Every woman, I think, wants a husband that will do that. And they too shall become one. Why is that important? Well, it's important because, and I'll, I'll touch on this, <clears throat> it's a demonstration on God and his church. God has given us a little drama here to show us how he relates to the church. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 5 talks about husbands loving their wives and wives submitting to their husbands and all this stuff. And he says, but I'm speaking a great mystery to you. Now, if you get, if you get the symbol wrong, you're going to get the truth wrong. He said, I'm speaking to you concerning Christ and the church. What I've really been talking about when I was talking about men and women, I really was talking about how Christ relates to the church. Christ left his home and laid down his life for his bride. Now, if we don't get marriage right, we're messed up with God. We're messed up with Christ. We're messed up with the church. We're messed up. I think we're messed up. Because we're building our homes and our relationships on human thinking. The love of God's not human. What he's trying to do is convert us to the way he loves and not how we love because we love in a selfish way. He loves in an unselfish way. Completely. And I'll tell you something. It takes some unselfishness to make it work. My, my wife and I were thinking about getting married, talking about it, planning to. I said, um, how do you think this works? And she was raised in a good family and loved God. She said, well, I don't know, is it 50-50? I 
I said, I don't think so. I think it's 100 100. Because if it's 50 50, you can take your 50 and I can take mine. And we didn't do that. And then one day she uh, <clears throat> was told she had stage four cancer. And there came a period of time where I had to give 100. And many times she had given 100. There's no relationship going to last very long when it's just half. The Bible doesn't say love the Lord your God with half your heart. And he'll love you with half his. Love, covenant love is unselfish love. For God so loved the world. Now, we want stable homes because we want children to be born I'm telling you, I'm having trouble because I, I really want to shout and try not to. We want children to be born into a stable environment. When, 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 when I took and my wife took that baby home, we didn't want to put it in a place where we may not make it and that baby is on its own. My daughter works with children in Costa Rica and my son-in-law. And uh, they've adopted five. They have about 11 in their house, two natural born. The five they adopted had three different fathers. Um, and they're my grandkids. I'm going to see them in a few days, and they've done a wonderful job. I love those kids. Listen, stability makes all the difference in the world. Don't you ever believe anybody that tells you that separation in the family doesn't hurt the kids. That's a lie. Now, kids can recover. God can use it some way. The Lord's a redeemer. But don't think that instability doesn't affect a person. It does. When my father spoke to me and my mother spoke to me, I knew I could take it to the bank, and sometimes I wish it wasn't true what they said because it sounded like murder to me. Anyway, uh, they promised to discipline me if I did this, and they didn't, they didn't say it 12 times. When they said they loved me, I believed it. <laughs> Service will be over in just a minute. <laughs> I plowed up another snake. I, I, I shouldn't have brought the discipline matter up. I know that uh, that hurts self-esteem. It's somewhere in the Bible, isn't it? I don't know, somewhere. So, God promises to be faithful. He sheds blood to guarantee that he will. Then he says, I'm going to give you an illustration in marriage. And I'm going to let the man play the role of Christ, and I'm going to let the woman play the role of the church. And I'll show you how it's supposed to be done, and it will tell you how I do it and how the church ought to do it. And I want those homes to be stable because the family of God is. And the Lord said, to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the fruitfulness of humanity was born in a secure environment? He said that to Noah. After the flood, he said to Noah, be fruitful, multiply. And Jesus said it to his disciples. Only he said it this way, make disciples in all nations. Wouldn't it be wonderful if all those disciples were born into a stable church? How can we have that? Well, <clears throat> understanding God's covenant love. The Bible says wisdom is justified by its children. 
Our culture is testing that statement. You know, I assume you do, that 80% of young people leave church. They go off to college, they never come back. Why is that? Because we haven't established them in the faith. And they go to where their ideas are tested, and they will be, even when I was in college, seminary, it's tested. My faith is not in what I believed. My faith is in God and what he said. What holds it together? Covenant love. What causes it to come apart? Selfishness. Jesus prayed that they may be one, even, Father, as you and I are one. We don't believe in three gods. We believe in one God. We believe Jesus and the Father are one. How could that be? Because of covenant nature, there can be no division. There can be no separation. Three persons and one Godhead. Why is that? Because the very nature of the divine nature miss that, if we miss that, the result is fragmentation. Church is fragmented, sectarian, scattered. Jesus said that they may be one that the world might believe. Division is the greatest hindrance to evangelism. How do we get over it? Well, start by understanding the love of God, that it's unselfish, to love our enemies, those that persecute us, those that despitefully use us. And then there's the martyrs who die testifying of Jesus Christ. Western Christianity is so far from New Testament Christianity, it's unbelievable. And I've been convicted when I read the Sermon on the Mount. Do I love with the love of God? Do I love this man with the love of God? Do I love you with the love of God? Or am I just an opportunist who happens to have an opportunity to speak? We don't love those to whom we minister. We're not covenant people. I never wanted to be a preacher. There have been times since I didn't want to be. I didn't because I grew up in a preacher's home. If it wasn't that they made a whole lot of money, I wouldn't have done it. <coughs> you got to know when to laugh, folks. No, the fact is, my parents had given me to God when I was born without asking. And um, I went through two years of hell trying to figure out if that was really what he wanted and if I was going to do it. And um, he scared me more than once. I won't go into all that. But he gave me a promise. Because one of the main reasons I didn't want to be a minister is because I didn't have the character. Um, I wasn't clergy material. That's the way I looked at it. My dad was a great man. Dad pastored his last church 35 years. A lot of people told me when he died he was the best pastor they ever had. Dad was a good man. I just didn't figure that I could be like him. And the Lord made me a promise. He said in Philippians 4.19, he would supply all my needs, and I knew it wasn't just money, according to his riches and glory through Jesus Christ. And I said, all right, if you promise you will supply all my needs, whatever they are, and there are many, I'll do this. And I 
I wrote it on a piece of paper, and I put it in a frame and hung it on the wall. I'm 78 years old. God has supplied all my needs. He never fails. He won't fail you because he's a covenant God. Covenant making, covenant keeping. Let me encourage you. Don't trust yourself. Don't put your final trust in everybody else. Put your trust in the covenant blood of Jesus Christ.